Today, I'm going to be completely dismantling the entire British Empire by playing as friends and exploiting their bureaucratic ability to become the biggest merchants on the planet, all while watching the British GDP line go down. Today, we're going to be playing Victoria 3, a game about the Industrial Revolution. And if you couldn't tell by the name, it's where Great Britain reigns supreme. Now, you see, if you're a smooth brain like me, you probably enjoy Victoria 3 for its economic complexity. City. Line go pew, Ottawa go Tee! Line go brr, Ottawa go huh? Line go meow, Ottawa go bruh. Now I'm not saying anything revolutionary here, this is just simple economics. Anyways, I thought what if I could take that feeling of line go down and turn it into one of the happiest feelings in the world. So today I plan to exploit this game, get super powerful, absolutely destroy the British GDP, and laugh while line go down. Because who wouldn't love to see Great Britain go from first to last? So today I'm going to be playing as France. France themselves are an economic powerhouse and coupled with with a couple exploits I found are going to be absolutely perfect for what we're trying to accomplish here today. So we'll start our journey in our capital here. Now the astute among you will notice right smack dab in the middle of Paris. If you look really closely, you'll see the letter R. Now, I'm going to start off building a little bit more in my construction sectors. Now, the construction sector just increases the construction efficiency in this state and is going to allow us to build up France a lot quicker. After we build up our construction sectors, I'm going to go around and find any logging camps I can and build those out. The reason for that is today I'm going to be using an exploit to give us unlimited bureaucracy, which is this currency right up here. Now, you can spend bureaucracy on a lot of important things in this game. For example, every time you set up a trade route, you spend of bureaucracy. Trade routes are important because you can tax the goods going in and out of your country to make you money. So you can imagine if I had unlimited bureaucracy, I could pretty much have unlimited trade routes and unlimited money. Not only that, but you can use government bureaucracy to invest in your government institutions. For example, if I wanted better law enforcement or better education for my people, I could spend massive amounts of bureaucracy and crank those levels up. You see, the more educated my people are, the more literate they're gonna be. And the more literate they're gonna be, the quicker we're gonna be able to research technologies. And if we could research technologies quicker than everybody around us, well, I have a feeling our army's gonna be pretty much unstoppable. So these buildings here, government administration buildings, take good paper and produce bureaucracy. And for limited bureaucracy, I'm not going to need very many of these, but I am going to need a lot of paper. And what do we need to make paper? But lovely, lovely trees. Then oh boy, we're going to need a lot of trees. You see, when I told you I was taking down Great Britain, a country with clearly inferior bulldogs, I bet you a lot of people were thinking, oh, he's going to slowly and surely chip away at them, reducing their power. No, no, no. We're going to be completely destroying their economy in one fell swoop. By the time we're done with them, I want this guy to be so poor, his only form of sustenance is going to be mixing leaves and water. Or maybe they already do that. Hmm. They're gonna be really poor is all I'm saying. But you know who's not gonna be really poor? You! Because today's video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Raid, Raid, Raid! The best mobile game of all time that is completely and totally free to play. My favorite faction is the High Elves. Their lore is pretty awesome. Their homeland, Aravia, has survived the fall of the Lizardman Empire. After infighting and civil war nearly ended the elves, their homeland survived, rebuilt, and is now stronger than ever. The lore here is absolutely sick. My favorite high elf is the Jingle Hunter. Look at him, all Christmassy and whatnot. And this month is huge for Raid. They just released a brand new faction, the Sylvan Watchers, with some amazing new champions. Forest Elves and Struids Phase, you name it, you can summon them all, and I'm super excited for their new season of the Forge Pass, where you can get some of the most powerful gear in the game. If you have Amazon Prime, you can get exclusive rewards in Raid right now. This is the best time to get started playing Raid. If you click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on screen, you'll get unique bonuses worth over $30. We're talking a free epic champion, Ina, 200k in silver, one energy refill, one XP boost, and one ancient shard so you can summon all champions as soon as you get in the game. A huge thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Now back to the game. So in terms of our technology, I'm gonna go up the society tree because the society tree has a little one called steel frame buildings. Now what steel frame buildings allows you to do is build skyscrapers. So we are gonna rush this one as fast as we can and use skyscrapers to 
completely destroy the economy. Trust me when I say they are completely broken and are going to allow us to dominate the entire world. So as we're working on building up our infrastructure, I also need to get my trade networks going for my little strategy here. Now you have to have an interest in an area to be able to trade with them. And there's a limit to the number of interests you can have. For example, I have an interest down here in Iberia so I can trade with Spain. But if I were to remove this, we wouldn't be able to trade with them. You see, if I wanted to sell fertilizer to Spain, it would help my economy by 37.5 pounds. That's calculated by the amount it would help our economy minus the tariffs Spain is putting on the product. However, in the game, there's something called treaty ports, which are completely, totally, and absolutely overpowered. So if I'm looking at India over here, France starts the game with a treaty port here in Pondicherry. So a treaty port is essentially a small port in that state that allows you to trade with the people of that region, but bypass all tariffs and embargoes. Meaning if we had one here with Spain, it's really likely that our trade revenue would be a lot higher because we didn't have any tariffs reducing the value. Higher trade revenue means more money for our people, meaning a better standard of life, meaning the more people that will want to live in the French market, and with more people means we can produce more goods and become an economic powerhouse. I'm gonna try and get some treaty ports pretty much in all of South America down here. Maybe a good chunk of Africa as well. I want to trade with as much of the world as I possibly can as cheaply as possible. So taking a look down here in Brazil, I think they would be a prime target to take a treaty port in. Starting the game, Brazil's in a war in their north and their south. Looking at Brazil, they only have 25 battalions and 22 conscript battalions, and we have a whopping 260. 60. So I'm hoping by flexing our military muscles, they will just capitulate and we won't even have to go to war with them over this treaty port. Playing as France and hoping the other guy surrenders in a war? Boy, this game isn't very realistic Boy. now, is it? So it turns out Brazil decides they want to fight us for this, mostly because guess who's supporting them? Those cocky British. Okay, doesn't matter, we still got this. Now, invading somewhere not connected by land is a little bit tricky. You have to do a naval invasion. So over here, you can see France starts with two admirals, one with four 45 ships, the other with 60 ships. They also start with four generals, each with varying amounts of battalions. If I were to take this general with 45 ships and launch a naval invasion, he is gonna ask, which general do you wanna bring? Do you wanna bring Chal over here? Now, good old Chucky has 100 battalions, yet he only has 45 ships. We are gonna take a massive penalty if we actually go ahead with this, because this navy is too small to support this battalion. So I'll go ahead and pick uh, good old Guy over here, and we'll do a nice naval invasion with him. Now, he's going to deliver Guillaume to the front lines. Now, Guillaume has 60 units, and he has 60 ships, so we won't take any penalties. I'm going to go ahead with this naval invasion. And now that we're on the shores, it's time for our first little exploit. If I want to get Shal onto the front lines and say, okay, I want you to go advance on these front lines, you can see that he'll be showing up in 63 days. That's a long time to wait as he slowly comes from France to Brazil and walks through the jungle. But if I say, hey, actually, I don't want you to advance. I want you to defend. Actually, you know what? I want you to advance again. Well, would you look at that? He's automatically on the front line from flipping him to attack defense, attack defense. Ah. Oh. Finally, an exploit for somebody as indecisive as me. You love to see it. And I think we should name this genius military strategy after the famed French general that only wore sandals, Philip Flop. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be here all week. And it looks like we're running into some British soldiers, but we are just absolutely trouncing them. Go on home, British soldiers, go on home. Have you got no fucking homes of the road? I bet you'd love me to explain why so you can understand the warfare and absolutely destroy your enemies. Well, too bad, because I don't understand it either. I can't wait for the game where Paradox will give sufficient tool tips on launch day. Thank you, Paradox. And it looks like Brazil is proposing a peace deal to give us the treaty port. That's fine by me. And we have our beautiful treaty port down here. And as you can see, we don't have an interest declared over here in Brazil, yet we could still trade with them. So I want to keep grabbing more treaty ports. I think down here in Argentina, that would probably be the next best option. And Argentina just capitulated without a fight. They gave me my nice treaty port. I think the next one I'm going to do is up here in Ecuador. And Ecuador just let us have it as well. 
Okay, so the year is 1840, and I've pretty much just gone around to most of the Americas, as well as Africa, and I've gotten treaty ports pretty much everywhere. I got some here in Costa Rica. I got some in the Zulu Nation. I have one up here in Persia. I was able to secure one in Greece. So right now, I would say we have access to a huge chunk of the globe strictly via treaty ports. Now we need to turn our focus onto our economy and spend the next 20 to 30 years building the biggest, most badass economy we can in the world. But before we get into actually building, I want to talk about my money for a second. If I come take a look at my budget, you can see we have a medium taxation level, we have some consumption taxes, and our government wages and military wages are about medium. What I'm going to do is crank these down, crank my taxes all Yoink. the way up. What that's going to do is give me a ton of money. So having high taxes is going to strain and piss off my population. And we wouldn't want them to revolt. God knows the French love a good revolution. So I'm just going to use these high taxes to build a ton of buildings, and then I'll slowly bring that down. The next big item I really want to keep producing is tools. Tools are super useful all throughout the entire game. They're cheap to produce. Before I do that, I have all this extra cash to play with now. So I'll invest in my construction sector a bit so I can build them way faster. Subsequently, if we take a look at our technology, we are currently researching with innovation at plus 66 per year. But if I take a look, I can have a maximum of 120 innovation because we have a high literacy level. I can essentially double the speed at which I'm researching researching things. So I'm just going to crank out a couple universities so we could research technology faster. Like I mentioned before, I'm rushing steel frame buildings. Why? Well, it's going to give us access to skyscrapers, the game breaking resource that will let me snowball to the top of the world. Not only that, but it gives us a production method called steel frame buildings. So taking a look at one of my construction sectors, I can see that the production method for steel frame buildings is going to need glass, steel, and explosives. I'm going to start building out that industry as well. I'll crank up the the steel mines I have over here, as well as the glass manufacturing I have down here. And I'm going to begin developing chemical plants to produce dynamite. Okay, so we've successfully unlocked steel frame buildings. This is perfect. So now that that technology has been researched, we can switch over to the steel frame building production method and start thinking about building skyscrapers. Now the game does a terrible job exploiting skyscrapers, so I'm going to have to let you in on this information. Skyscrapers can only be built in any province where an urban center is of size 20 or greater. Not only that, but skyscrapers consume a massive amount of paper. So before we build one, we're going to have to address both of those issues. So you can see there's already some paper mills around France. So I'm just going to beef each of these up probably to about 30 or so. Next, let's talk about urban centers. So for urban centers to grow, for every size, they need 100 urbanization, meaning I'm going to need 2000 urbanization. And I've picked Orleans because there's not much going on there. And they seem to have a half decent population. So when the time comes, we'll have enough people to work in our skyscraper buildings. So for each one of our manufacturers, this gives us roughly 20 urbanization. And for each one of our agriculture sectors, they give us five urbanization. So I'm going to build an absolutely massive amount of infrastructure here. I need to grind this up to an urban center size of 20. The next technologies I'm going to be researching are down the military tree, anything relating to docks and ports. I need to be able to max out my ports and have a ton of ships trading with the world. Okay, so we have 20 development here in Orleans. Now that we currently have our urban center at 20, I'm just going to keep cranking out the paper mills all around my provinces. There we go. We're just cranking them out. At the same time, we are making money and we are in the green now. So it's time I can kind of come over and reduce Yoink. my taxes. And as we wait, you'll see that we are the number one worldwide producer of paper. We literally cannot even employ people with these paper mills. The wages are so low because paper is so cheap because we're producing it in such massive quantities. But this is totally fine. We just have to have the paper mills built because when we execute this exploit, the cost of paper is going to shoot through the roof and these paper mills are going to be completely maxed out constantly. Over here in Orleans is where I plan to build my skyscrapers. So I'm just going to max out the construction sector here. You can very clearly see that we're making a ton of money. So improving our construction sector will just let us build things faster, although it will cost us more. So like we talked about before, when we have unlimited bureaucracy, we're going to be spending some of that on our trade network. So it's time now I go around and build out my ports and max them out all over the world. You can see that ports provide us with convoys. And what are convoys used for? But trading. So if we come over here to my trade routes, you can see we currently need 7,000 convoys. And for every trade route we're setting up, for example, one with Great Britain over here, 
Well, you can see that that number increases. So let's go ahead and max out our ports now. So now that we've completed all that, it's finally time to start surveying for a skyscraper spot and completely breaking this game. Our architects are gonna begin taking our steel frame and concrete to make a massive building. So let's go ahead and do this. And because Orleans is the only urban center with a size above 21, it'll naturally go there. And the reason I want it there is because there's no critical infrastructure in Orleans that's really important to my economy. We just have some farms and some glass. So if all those people move to the skyscraper building and work there instead, well, it's not really gonna hurt me at all. So surveying the skyscraper is going to take two full years. But after that, we are going to be cracking at great Britain will fall eventually okay so we've got our skyscraper site identified taking a peek our architects and engineers have identified or leads as the optimal spot let's lay the foundation giving us a plus 10 percent construction sector building throughput perfect so i think we are just about ready to get going here the year is 1867 and i want to build a couple skyscrapers now here's the thing about skyscrapers you're only supposed to build one however there's a little bit of a bug right now as long as you've not finished one skyscraper you can keep pressing this button as many times as you want and if you give me a button I'm gonna press it. And what skyscrapers do is they provide plus 25% throughput to your government administration buildings. We are gonna be able to pull insane amounts of bureaucracy off of one single government administration building. That's going to allow us to build things at a ridiculous speed. Thanks to state construction efficiency boosts when you have a surplus of bureaucracy. Not only that, but it'll essentially allow us to set up infinite trade routes, which cost bureaucracy. Oh, it's perfect. And a large numbers of Franco Canadian people have begun migrating to our state of Pondicherry. God, would I love to see a Quebecois in southern India. The other thing that's going to happen, though, is the amount of paper input into this government administration building is going to skyrocket. And with an increased demand for paper is going to come a higher price for paper. That's why all throughout my lands, I've been building these paper manufactories. So as we are about to finish our first set of skyscrapers, you are going to see a lot of changes for the better. And there we are, 50 skyscrapers. People will slowly and surely begin working in the skyscraper building over here. And as it's rising, you can see the price of papers got up significantly. Not only that, but our government administration throughput is up over 1000%, meaning two simple government administration buildings are giving us over 2000 bureaucracy. We are absolutely flying here. You definitely should not be allowed to do this. This should go up to 25% at most. Now, the first First thing I'm going to do with this bureaucracy is come over and pretty much max out all of these institutions. It doesn't cost me anything but bureaucracy, and I have an absolute ton of it. And this is going to give us huge boosts all over the game. Increasing our health system is going to decrease mortality, which will allow us to have more people working. Investing in our education institution will give us increased education, which will increase our literacy and our speed at which we can research things. Not only that, but here in our market, we could start start really importing all kinds of goods. Why? Well, we have a metric ton of additional convoys from all those ports I built, and we have declared interests at treaty ports at a huge part of the globe, meaning we can buy and sell goods essentially free all over the place. So in my market over here, I'm just going to be buying and selling goods from all over the world. Anything that is productive will be good for my economy. And just like this, we have shot up in the rankings. We are still behind Great Britain, but I'm telling you, it's not going to be for long. And look at that bureaucracy climb. I'm wondering actually how much I can crank this up before the game just crashes. Later. <laughs> Okay, that was a bad idea. So I can't have infinite trade routes, but I can have a lot of them. And you can see with this, our standard of living is just shooting up. Our GDP is flying up as well. Oh, man. But we're not done yet, ladies and gentlemen. We currently have 250. 40 paper bills, and I want to make that even more. Over here at Picardy, we currently have 50. I'm just going to crank this up and give him another 25. You know what? I'm just going to give him 100 paper mills. We have a surplus of 20,000 bureaucracy, giving us a 10% state construction efficiency across the board. I'm going to just keep spending that on imports and exports, really making sure that goods are just super cheap in my market. Not only am I going to have a ton of imports, but I'm also going to have a ton of exports too. 
I'm just going to export anything that is remotely efficient for me to export. So now we turn our attention to our uh, <coughs> friends, Great Britain. They are currently number one in the world, but not for long, I'll tell you that much. Now, just in case things kick off and we need to wage war against them, I'm gonna start investing in different things. First, I'm gonna start investing in my barracks. The barracks is the building where your soldiers are trained. And we're in France, so with this production method, we'll specifically be training our soldiers how to make a white flag out of literally anything. Next, in order to supply my armies, I'm going to need a munitions plant and some arms manufacturers. And in terms of technology, next I'm going to start looking down the military tree, specifically bolt-action rifles. Honestly, the only reason I'm doing this, I noticed when you're at war with somebody, if you have better tech them, you pretty much automatically win. Like I mentioned, now that we have access to better education, we can research things faster, we'll have better tech than them, and pretty much steamroll them. Next, I'm going going to try and declare war on modern day Pakistan because they have a resource I really really need. Okay and after a quick naval invasion looks like we'll secure this and after I secure all of Kalat also it's time I produce the resource I was looking for. I'm something of a florist myself. So the reason I grabbed opium is because I could change the production method here in my barracks to have better medical aid for my units. Now, taking a look at Great Britain, they got a lot of battalions and a lot of flotillas. No wonder they're the most powerful nation in the world. Look at their GDP, man. Line go up, 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 but not for long. So with two clicks here, I am going to set off the chain of events that will lead to Great Britain's demise. I'm gonna come on over to them. I'll click on interactions and then scroll down to this one down here, embargo. Meaning they cannot access our market at all. You can see here that we're still trading all these things because these are trade routes I control. I've set these up so they are dependent on us for pretty much all of these goods. They're counting on the fact we're shipping them cheap goods and we're buying up the things they produce. Meanwhile, I've built up my economy at home in France, so I'm not dependent on them at all. So I'm going to slowly and surely remove the goods I'm sending them, meaning they're going to have a shortage of those goods. They won't have access to any of our big cherries Grosse cerise. None of our munitions, none of our ships, and oh boy, is that going to be a problem for them. And I'm also going to remove the ones I'm exporting from them, meaning they have fewer people buying those goods, the price will go down, and they won't be able to pay their workers in their factories, leading to civil unrest and hopefully revolution. And immediately, just looking at their market price, everything is super expensive, specifically their military goods. And that is good. <laughs> yeah, boy. Essentially, if you have a shortage of goods for your military, well, your military is going to take a severe penalty. Hell, even their super important goods like paper are way more expensive now. So now all I have to do is sit back, relax, and watch the line go down and the British Empire crumble. Oh, what an absolutely beautiful sight. That is bloody lovely. Many months later. Bruh, what is this? Line no go down. Line go up. Okay, we gotta do something about this. Okay, so I gotta fix this once and for all. I've declared a war against them to absolutely humiliate them. I'm gonna come on over, add a war goal, and open the British market so they can't collect any tariffs on trade. It is a free market economy. Not only that, but I'm gonna add some more goals here. I'm going to liberate the Netherlands. I'm gonna liberate Wales. And hell, why don't I liberate the British Raj at the same time? Losing three major kingdoms under them is going to be a massive hit to their economy. Yeah, I don't know why England controls the Netherlands in this game. Don't ask me. So the first thing I'm going to do is activate all my conscripts. Then I'm going to go ahead and do a naval invasion. But I have a bit of a secret. If you do a naval invasion, Britain will automatically send all of their navy to that first naval invasion. So if I just wait a day and then do a second naval invasion on their capital, I will be met with no resistance. Perfect. Oh my days, and we're just trouncing them regardless because we have so much better tech. Yeah, the British Navy is the best in the world. <coughs> Give me a break. Okay, so our boys have landed completely unopposed, and we now have a foothold on Britain. Oh, we are just steamrolling over them, and with this last battle, that'll be an epic dubski. Oh, and look at all these war goals. You love to see it. Dude, and after some time, there's a huge revolution here. The communists are revolting. And, oh boy, line go down. Line go down lots. <laughs> 
and the British Empire lost the war. They got the, the, nobody in charge, and uh, the communists have taken over. I think that is a perfect place to end it, with Great Britain absolutely in tatters, and France reigning supreme. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you liked it. If you did, feel free to comment, like, subscribe, all that funny business. It's free for you, and it literally helps me more than you'll ever know. Thanks to my lovely patrons, and if I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. The Ottawa Welshman, the CK3 man, I'm the king of this land. Oh, and if you like this one, on screen right now is another video I'm sure you're gonna love. Got a thousand sons, all named John. They probably don't know that their cousin is the mom. Tutorials played through speed runs the win. No challenge too great for the Ottawa Welshman.